Operation Cyclone. In the days following the Chernobyl disaster, a secret mission unfolded high above the radioactive wreckage. Soviet Tu-16 bombers, typically used for long-range military strikes, took to the skies with a new urgent task, creating rain. The operation was led by Yuri Israel, head of the Soviet State Committee of Hydrometeorology. Two days after Reactor 4 exploded, a classified map arrived on his desk. It showed the radioactive cloud drifting toward Moscow. With millions of lives at stake, and the city preparing for the annual May Day Parade in Red Square, an event that could not be cancelled for fear of embarrassing the Soviet government, Israel issued a fateful order. Make it rain before the toxic clouds reach the capital. Just 48 hours after the explosion of Reactor 4, the operation began. Artillery shells filled with silver iodide were loaded into Tu-16 bombers at a Moscow airbase, and Soviet pilots set out to intercept the radioactive clouds. The pilots initially circled the burning reactor within a six-mile radius, but the wind continually pushed the radioactive plume farther out, forcing the crews to follow the black clouds for hundreds of miles. As they intercepted the clouds, they released the silver iodide, which acted like ice crystals, causing water vapor to condense and fall as rain. Villagers in the town of Naravia just 30 miles north of Chernobyl, watched in confusion as the sky filled with strange yellow and gray contrails. By 8 p.m., the clouds erupted into a deluge. Thunder rolled across the land, and black rain poured down in torrents, scouring radioactive particles from the air and sending them into the soil. These weren't the first weather modification missions for the Soviet Air Force. Since 1941, they had experimented with manipulating the weather and by the 1980 Moscow Olympics, the same Tu-16 bombers had been used to clear the skies for the games. But this mission, known as Operation Cyclone, was far riskier. The rain brought down not only water, but a toxic mix of radioactive isotopes, including cesium-137 and iodine-131. The seeded rain clouds dumped fallout across Belarus, sparing Moscow, but leaving entire villages drenched in radioactive precipitation. In Ukraine, an opposite weather modification operation unfolded. Pilots from the Institute of Hydrometeorology, this time in civilian aircraft, flew missions to stop rain clouds instead of inducing them. Concerned thunderstorms were spreading radiation into the Pripyat River, a key source of water for Ukraine. They dropped tons of a compound called Cement 600, a mixture of cement and drying agents into the clouds. This strange attempt to dry the skies created a five-month drought over parts of Ukraine, further altering the environment in a desperate bid to control the spread of radiation. By the winter of 1986, these operations had largely succeeded in protecting Moscow, but the cost was steep. Belarusian villages, drenched in radioactive rain, saw radiation levels spike 20 to 30 times above normal. Entire communities were left to face the grim consequences. Children sickened, cancer rates soared, and birth defects became tragically common. For years, Soviet officials denied that these cloud-seeding missions ever took place. But the truth left a haunting legacy in the forgotten villages of Belarus, where the rain that saved millions in Moscow had come at a terrible price. The First Photograph For years, the first photograph of the Chernobyl disaster remained as shrouded in mystery as the catastrophe itself. Igor Kostin's iconic image, grainy and fogged with radiation, is often claimed to be the earliest snapshot of the destroyed reactor. But Kostin wasn't the only one with a camera that day, and his photograph may not have been the first. In the pre-dawn hours of April 26, 1986, Kostin, a photographer for Novosti, received an urgent call. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant had exploded at 1.23 a.m. By late morning or early afternoon, he was aboard a helicopter, flying over the smoldering ruins of Reactor 4, though the exact time remains disputed. As he leaned out of the helicopter's window, armed with a medium-format Cube 6 camera, 
Costin later wrote how, quote, a big puff of hot air filled the cabin of the helicopter as he snapped what would become one of the most famous images of the disaster. But Costin's mission didn't go as planned. After capturing around 20 shots, his camera jammed, and when he developed the film, nearly all of his photographs were ruined. Radiation had corroded most of his film, leaving only one haunting image intact, taken around 14 hours after the explosion. Another photographer, Anatoly Ruskazov, also documented the disaster, potentially capturing some of the earliest images of the reactor that day. As a staff photographer at the plant, Ruskazov was called to the scene at 9 a.m. on April 26th. Ordered to photograph from a helicopter, he too leaned out, fighting against the ash-filled air as a soldier held his legs to keep him from falling. Using a Kiev 6 and a Zenit camera, Ruskazov recalled how, quote, there was so much ash flying around, it was impossible to take photographs through the glass. The helicopter hovered just 650 feet from the reactor, close enough for the radiation to burn his skin. His first roll of film, shot on the Zenit, was completely black, burned out by radiation. Quote, I think that's it, it's all over, he recalled. But his second roll, taken on the Kiev 6, produced usable images, cloudy but clear enough to reveal the devastation below. Back on the ground, Raskazov continued to document the scene, venturing dangerously close to the reactor in a fire truck. His photographs captured graphite blocks ejected from the reactor core and the destruction surrounding Reactor 4. However, unlike Kostin's image, Raskazov's work disappeared into Soviet secrecy. Upon handing over his photos to plant director Viktor Borokhanov, Soviet security forces immediately confiscated them. Raskazov was forbidden from speaking about what he had seen. His images remained classified for years. Despite the secrecy surrounding Raskazov's images, his photographs played a crucial role in helping Soviet authorities grasp the scale of the disaster. Yet, it wasn't until years later that some of his photos quietly surfaced without credit. So, which photograph was truly the first? While Kostin's photo is the one most widely associated with the disaster and often said to be the first, Raskozov's images, taken just hours earlier, challenged that claim. In the end, both men risked their lives and paid a steep price in their health so the world could see the truth. The Secret Convoy It was the dead of night, and Kiev slept. Through the quiet streets, a convoy of thirty trucks rumbled, each loaded with a secret lethal cargo. In the lead, Lieutenant Colonel Viktor Cherchnev clutched the wheel of a military truck, his Geiger counter screeching its warning. But it wasn't just the radiation from Chernobyl's exploded reactor trailing them. Among the convoy's anti-aircraft missiles were three tactical nuclear warheads, missiles capable of unimaginable devastation. Three days after Reactor No. 4 blew, Soviet forces scrambled to secure their military assets. Cherchnev's orders were clear. Evacuate the missiles, 27 armed with conventional warheads and three tipped with nuclear payloads from the Chernobyl Air Defense Base. The missiles, part of the S-75 Divina system, were notorious. It was a similar S-75 that shot down an American U-2 spy plane in 1960, igniting a Cold War crisis. Now, as the convoy rumbled through the heart of Kiev, a new crisis loomed, this time not from the west, but from within. The radioactive cloud that had blanketed the region was closing in on the convoy. The men in the convoy knew their trucks, missiles, and uniforms were saturated with radioactive dust. They'd been working in the contaminated zone for hours without protective gear, their only defense being the knowledge that orders were orders. In a slow, nerve-wracking crawl, the convoy traveled over 60 miles from Chernobyl to Kiev. It entered the city under the cover of darkness, passing over the Paton Bridge. The residents of Kiev, over two million people, slept, unaware of the nuclear-tipped weapons rolling through their streets. After crawling along for 14 hours, at speeds barely reaching 20 miles per hour, the convoy finally arrived at Borispiel Air Base. There, the S-75 missiles with their nuclear warheads were immediately dismantled by a special team 
for Cherchnev and his men, there was no celebration. Just two bottles of red wine for the officers. The drivers got nothing. The men scrubbed their trucks relentlessly, scrubbed until their hands bled, trying to remove the radioactive dust. Still, the Geiger counters clicked furiously. Their mission wasn't over. Cherchnev and his men were sent back to Chernobyl, making three more trips to retrieve equipment from the contaminated military base. Each journey was filled with the same silent terror, but the S-75 system, with its potential to destroy entire squadrons of enemy aircraft, was considered too valuable to leave behind, radiation or not. The system was a linchpin in the Soviet Union's strategic defenses, part of the Duga over-the-horizon radar system, known as the Russian Woodpecker, that kept watch for Western missiles. But now, those defenses were crumbling, and the equipment was left to rust. The convoy's mission was never acknowledged publicly. Cherchnev later described it as, quote, a futile operation, one that sacrificed men to save contaminated weapons. The real cost was paid in human lives. Of the soldiers who made the journey, many would later fall ill. Cherchnev's driver, just 28, died not long after the mission. Quote, no one knows what we went through, Cherchnev said bitterly years later. We didn't save anyone. We didn't clean up anything. For three years, the contaminated trucks and equipment remained at the Borisville base, ticking with radiation, until they were finally disposed of in a cemetery for dirty vehicles. But by then, the damage was already done. The nuclear warheads had been secured, but the men who carried out the mission were left to fend for themselves. Their exposure to radiation, an unspoken consequence of a mission the world was never meant to know. The Meat Train The summer of 1990 was hot in Ukraine. In a remote rail yard in the town of Poliska in northern Ukraine, a set of broken refrigerated train cars sat idle and roped off, their contents nearly as dangerous as the fallout from the reactor that had exploded four years earlier. Inside, 317 tons of radioactive meat waited for a destination that no one wanted to claim. This was not an isolated event. It was part of a broader Soviet strategy to handle the fallout from the Chernobyl disaster by distributing contaminated meat and produce as widely as possible. After the explosion of Reactor No. 4 in April 1986, life around Chernobyl changed overnight. 50,000 heads of livestock were rounded up from the radioactive zone, destined not for burial, as one might expect, but for the slaughterhouse. Soviet officials had devised a plan. Animals deemed too contaminated would be processed in factories across Ukraine and Belarus, mixed with uncontaminated meat and made into sausages. The strategy was chillingly simple. Dilute the radiation and spread it thin, and no one would notice they were consuming the very product of the disaster. Only the elite Soviet cities, Moscow and Leningrad, would be spared the tainted food. At meatpacking plants, the work was grueling and dangerous. Radiation monitors, hastily trained and ill-equipped, moved through the slaughterhouses, their counters beeping as they measured the meat hanging from hooks. Workers stood in the midst of it all, processing animals as fast as possible, racing to keep up with the relentless flow of contaminated carcasses. Cows had grazed on radioactive pastures, absorbing the fallout into their meat that was now being prepared for human consumption. By the summer of 1987, the system was overloaded. Freezers across the region were stuffed with meat that exceeded safe levels of contamination. In Belarus, the Gomel meat factory faced an impossible choice dispose of the radioactive meat as waste, or attempt to move it. Desperate to move the toxic meat out of sight, workers loaded the radioactive stock into four refrigerated train cars and sent it south, hoping to offload it in the Republic of Georgia. There, the shipment was swiftly rejected. It was only the first stop in what became a years-long odyssey. For the next four years, the train rumbled across Soviet railroads, a problem that no one wanted. At each station, the same scene played out. Local officials, armed with Geiger counters, waved their dosimeters over the freight cars and refused the load. And so the meat continued its journey, an endless loop of bureaucratic neglect, rolling from station to station. In 1990, 
The KGB eventually took control, after the refrigeration units began to fail, while the train cars were parked in the already highly contaminated region of northern Ukraine. Railroad workers, aware of the invisible danger, had refused to repair the cooling systems. The KGB arranged for the train to be driven to a remote part of Belarus, where they dug a cement-lined trench and buried the radioactive meat deep underground. This meat train and thousands of tons of other contaminated meat and produce represented the Soviet Union's futile attempt to control the uncontrollable, a grim reminder that some tragedies cannot simply be swept away. The Blue Flash When Reactor 4 erupted in catastrophe, the explosion sent shockwaves through the facility and a plume of radioactive debris into the skies. But there was something else piercing the darkness that night, something that continues to invite analysis decades later. Eyewitnesses reported a vivid blue flash, a phenomenon that some argue points to an even darker truth than the official account suggests. The widely accepted version of events describes a sequence beginning with a failed safety test. A surge of power triggered a steam explosion, followed by the reactor's core melting down. Radioactive material was thrown into the air in a second explosion of hydrogen gas that had been created when the exposed nuclear fuel and graphite began splitting water molecules. Yet, recent studies propose a different sequence, one where that blue flash might have been evidence of a nuclear detonation, not merely a steam eruption. A local fisherman, standing just 1,600 feet away, recalled hearing two blasts separated by a brilliant blue flash. Such accounts have led nuclear physicist Lars Erik de Geer to suggest that this blue flash could have been the first sign of a nuclear explosion. De Geer and his team backed this theory with radiation data from the Russian city of Cherepovets, 230 miles north of Moscow. Strangely, Cherepovets lay outside the known fallout path, yet four days after the explosion, scientists detected traces of Xenon-133, a radioactive isotope, drifting over the city. This suggested that a powerful nuclear blast had sent fallout two miles into the sky, where it could be carried by upper-level winds. Further evidence of the explosion's sheer force lies within the reactor itself. The blast was so powerful that it launched a 2,000-ton reactor lid into the air, where it landed precariously, nearly vertically, on the rim of the reactor tank. Seismic data and the damage pattern inside Reactor 4 including a melted six-and-a-half-foot-thick core plate, lend weight to the theory that a nuclear explosion preceded the steam blast. Often, glowing blue light around reactors is associated with Cherenkov radiation, a distinct phenomenon that occurs when charged particles, like electrons, travel faster than the speed of light in a medium. This glow is commonly observed in the cooling pools of nuclear reactors. Such a blue glow was seen by Alexander Yuvchenko, one of the workers at the plant, who described running outside of the reactor building and finding a strange blue light hanging in the air. However, the initial blue light witnessed at Chernobyl may have been something far more ominous, perhaps the immediate result of a nuclear blast where intense heat and ionizing radiation superheats the surrounding air, rather than just a byproduct of a reactor meltdown. More than three decades later, Many of Chernobyl's mysteries remain unsolved. The debate over the blue flash, whether it was a warning sign of a nuclear explosion or just a haunting glow from ionized air, lingers like the radiation now contained by the sarcophagus of Reactor 4. Which of these Chernobyl mysteries was most interesting? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark 5. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.